Alrighty, good morning class. Here we are with another poetry lesson coming at you. It is Wednesday now, midway through our week, and um, we are making good progress on our poetry unit. Even though it's only the first week of this, we've already covered quite a bit of ground, and we are figuring out how to identify meter. That's where we left off. Of course, we've covered other things like metaphor, alliteration, personification. I don't think we've done alliteration, actually, but we did do personification. Um, and those are all really important as well. We're actually going to come back to some of them for our poem today. But we left off with meter, and there were definitely some questions that you guys left, all pretty good questions. Some of you are just wondering, why do we read poetry at all? And it wasn't really related to the meter, per se. It was just kind of maybe frustration or uh, just dislike. <laughs> Just dislike of poetry, and you know we can. I can handle that if you dislike it. You just got to keep putting up with it and and doing your schoolwork. Um, but I'm I'm going to try to persuade you that it's worth your time, of course. And I, I'm I'm not going to answer the question about why we do poetry in a simple way. But I want that question to kind of unpack itself. Um, through the lessons to come. So after we've read four or five poems and we've, we've studied them closely, then maybe you can answer yourself um, that your own question about what is the value in sitting down to look at this piece of crafted language? What good does that do? And perhaps if you just open your mind a little bit and you give it a shot, then uh, you'll find some merit, some some worth in poetry, and you'll be able to have a good defense of poetry leaving the class. That's my hope for you. Um, but we're going to talk about meter, and a few of you answered the question, the first question incorrectly. The correct answer was, um, what type of feet did we examine? We examined iams and anapes, and some of you put stressed and unstressed. That's actually not a type of foot. Um, that's a type of syllable. Uh, so every word has syllables. I'm looking at a word right now. It says recording. Recording. That's three syllables. Um, cell phone. Cell phone. Piano. Piano. Um, though, so you can, you can do this, um, this exercise yourself by simply clapping to the word and breaking it up into little chunks. Now, when we take a step and move to the foot or feet of the poem, then we are looking at little bundles of syllables arranged in a particular pattern. I'm going to say that one more time and I would write this down. Um, when we move from syllables to feet, or the foot of the poem, then we are suddenly talking about little bundles of syllables, patterns, in a, t in a certain pattern that gets repeated every single line. Um, and that is what the meter is made up of, of certain patterns that we call feet. And the two that we introduced to you yesterday were iams and anapests. And if something is using iams, in each line, then the poem is iambic. And if it's using anapes, then the poem is, you can guess it, anapestic. A great, great literary word. You should treasure that one in your heart. Um, and the patterns of these syllables that we see here, for iams, it starts with an unstressed syllable, and it's paired with a stressed syllable. Anapest is the same exact thing, except instead of one unstressed syllable, you get two unstressed syllables in that little bundle of syllables. And so those are the two that we're looking for in poetry going forward. And like I said, this is all formal verse, where there's a, a formal pattern. And it's just fine. It happens all the time when um, poets, especially modern-day poets, break away from these patterns and they don't use any meter whatsoever. However, most of the time um, of history we've had poets that stick to a certain meter and they don't do that for no reason. There's a there's a kind of a pleasure that we get as readers 
when a poet masterfully uses this meter in a way that makes the poem sound like music. So that's why we study meter. And I told you that the best way to study these meters is to tap it out. Ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. That is iambic. Uh, and for anapestic, we have da-da-dum, 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 da-da-dum. That for as many uh, feet are on the line. So that's our, that's our tricks. Let's move forward now. Um, here we go. Yes, uh, green eggs and ham, the classic Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss was a wizard when it came to meter. Uh, he was exact in his, in his metrics of his poems. And so you could read through an entire children's book written by Dr. Seuss and follow the meter over and over. Um, sometimes it is exactly the same throughout, and sometimes he will throw in a little variation on the meter to catch you and make you think about it a little more. But most of the time, uh, kids that are young especially don't pay any attention to the meter, but they can still hear it in their minds and, and feel it, right? You can feel the music and the repetition and the, um, the rhythm of Dr. Seuss, which is why he's such a classic for children's literature. Um, so we feel the effect of it, even though we don't study and examine it. But let's study and examine it, because we are seventh graders, right? We know how to do this stuff. Um, so my case to you is that this is in iams. It's iambic. I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. So I just hit myself a lot. But the point was that you can hear the IMs, you can tap it out, um, and you just have to keep that beat to hear it. But um, the reason that we talked about how this is such a genius, not genius, but a, a artistic thing to do and not just random, I'm not just forcing the syllables to sound that way. He actually picked words that fit the pattern. Um, and some of you had said, I don't really see it. How can words be stressed or unstressed? It's just a matter of how you're saying it. Well, actually not. And you can figure this out by simply trying to do it the opposite way. So even at the level of words, we use iambic um, patterns. So like the word delay or belong or equate or destroy or attain. And I wrote down a few others when I was thinking of it this morning. Uh, delay, delete, submerge, surprise, apply, regret. All of these words, if you try to put it the other way, that is, emphasize the first syllable rather than the second, it does not sound like the same word. Think about it. Delay, belong, equate, destroy. Uh, no, it's delay, belong, equate, destroy. Uh, can you hear the difference in my voice? I'm emphasizing. Emphasize means to put more breath into it, more volume into it when you're saying it. Um, I'm emphasizing different syllables when I say it in those two different ways. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Send me a message if you need more help understanding which one is emphasized. But the point in giving you all these words is that you are automatically emphasizing syllables in words all the time. And in poetry, you're just paying more attention to which words receive which emphasis. Okay. So I, I've highlighted for you, in, or I've uh, put in blue text, the words where the emphasis falls. And I've shown you that it's iambic because it, it doesn't start with a blue word here, right? I would, it lands on would, and would is emphasized. I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. You, know, you have two emphases in that one word anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. Um, the next question to ask yourself, now that we've established that this is iambic, is how many I ams are in each line? Um, let's count them. 
I would, that's one, not like, that's two, them here or there. So we have four. We're trying to number off what these or how many of these IMs or anapests that we have in a line. We want to use some special names to describe how many there are. Um, instead of just saying it's a four meter or a three meter, we actually use some fancy terms. But you'll already know some of these terms. Like if you've ever played the game Monopoly, right? Mono, mon, uh, is mono is first, um, is the first part of that word. And it means one owner, monopoly, they have a monopoly. Um, mono means one. And let's think by, right? If you have a bicycle, by, bicycle means two. If you have a tricycle, tri, tri means three. These are all prefixes. Um, if you have a tetrad, I think in Mrs. Studi's class, you study how chromosomes split um, and they have those tetrad shape, four different parts. Yeah, that's that. the word tetra is in there. Tetra just means four. And penta, part of the word pentagon, penta means five. And so these are just fancy words, but they just represent a number. And with uh, when we count the feet of a line, like up here, I would not like them here or there. There's four, right? So we take that prefix for four, which is tetra, and we combine it with the word meter. So we've been studying meter. Together, the fancy word that we have for this meter is tetrameter. So these are iams, and they're in a tetrameter, so you would call it iambic tetrameter. Wow, what a beautiful phrase. Um, after that, we've talked about, um, you would just plug in whatever number is on the line, however many feet are on the line, and then you would describe that with another type of meter. So this was four for tetrameter. If you had three, it would be a trimeter. If you had five, it would be a pentameter, which is used in Shakespeare all the time. Pentameter. We'll, we'll save that for eighth grade, though. For now, just look at those, um, the titles of the different meters and try to follow along with why we call them what we call them. Let's move along. So now that we've did IMs, let's look at some more Dr. Seuss. Horton, here's a who. Um, to look at anapest. Remember, anapest have two uh, unstressed syllables bundled up with one stressed syllable. So it's da-da-dum, 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 da-da-dum. Let's see if we can hear it in Dr. Seuss. On the 15th of May in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing, enjoying the jungle's great joys when Horton the elephant heard a small noise. <laughs> it's a good way to ruin a poem if you, if you just say it like that and sound all robotic when you're trying to find the meter. Of course, normally it would just sound on the 15th of May, in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, right? You say, it's, it's more flowy when you read it normally. But when you're breaking it down, then you really got to keep to the beat. Um, this is a, from a Moana song. I haven't seen Moana, I apologize. But here's the Anapes in that Moana song. See the line where the sky meets the sea. Do you hear the unstressed and then the stressed? In the sky, da-da-dum, da-da-dum. Good. I'm going to stop yelling at you guys. Sometimes your everyday words and phrases are anapest as well. Um, so here's a phrase. Hit the nail on the head. Da-da-dum, da-da-dum. In the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. Da-da-dum, da-da-dum. Even single words. Understand. Contradict. You don't say contradict or contradict. You'd say contradict. You wouldn't say understand. <laughs> you can try it. Maybe your friends will think that's okay. Um, here we go. We're going to take a turn. It's 16 minutes into the lesson. All right. Sorry for the glitch there. I had some headphone difficulties, so I have to re-record this last part of the lesson. Um, but this is a poem by Liesl Mueller called Things. 
this does not have much to do with what we just studied with the meter because Liesl Mueller happens to be writing in free verse, meaning that there is no um, consistent meter throughout the poem. And if you try to find the IMs or the anapests or some other type of meter, you won't be able to find it because it's inconsistent. That doesn't mean it's a bad poem or any worse than a metered poem. Um, it just means that Liesl Mueller had a different approach to writing her poem and, and meter wasn't part of the agenda for her. Um, but this poem is immensely valuable in other respects, one of them being our study of metaphor and also of personification. So what is personification? It is giving non-human things human-like attributes or qualities. And we do this all the time without even thinking about it. You don't have to be a poet, or perhaps we're all poets in that sense, because it's part of our everyday speech, um, which is what Mueller really wants to show in this poem and actually bring to life for you. And there's something deeply mysterious about how we do this as humans and why we do this as humans, how it seems that everything around us we breathe ourselves into. Um, so without any more comments from me, I will let you experience this poem by Liesl Mueller called Things. What happened is we grew lonely living among the things. So we gave the clock a face, the chair a back, the table four stout legs, which will never suffer fatigue. We fitted our shoes with tongues as smooth as our own and hung tongues inside bells so we could listen to their emotional language. And because we loved graceful profiles, the pitcher received a lip, the bottle a long, slender neck. Even what was beyond us was recast in our image. We gave the country a heart, the storm an eye, the cave a mouth, so we could pass into safety. Yeah? Yeah? You like it? Okay. Uh, so after you have paused the video to go cry and delight over this poem, uh, let's talk about the metaphors that we see. It's, it's, it's like this poem is in the process of creating metaphors, that it's, it's stopped the, the system and paused it just so you can see how it works and how we do this all the time and analyze it. It's like the poem is analyzing itself, you could say. Uh, what happened is we grew lonely. So this is her comments on why we use metaphors. Well, we're surrounded by a world of lots of things that aren't us. <laughs> we're, we live in an environment of non-human things and... Um, we need to bring them to life. That's what she's saying. We're, we've got lonely in our bones, and therefore we're going to put ourselves in everything and make meaning out of it. Living among the things. So we gave the clock a face, the chair a back, the table forced out legs, a face for the clock, a back for, a back for the chair, and the legs for the table. These are very commonplace household objects. I can see a table there, a chair that I'm sitting in right here, and a clock on the wall. Perhaps you can do that in your own home as well. Uh, the purpose is that all of these things have been personalized, uh, and we don't even know it. Um, we would easily call this the back of the chair or the, the legs of the table. And once you take a second to look at that, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Who decided? Who first said that, oh, no? That table has legs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny when you think about it. Um, and she goes on to, to say, well, it's not just those things. It's, it's tongues. And how, how weird is it that shoes have tongues, a shoe tongue? Uh, or the tongues of bells in the mouth of bells. Um, and even something as mundane as a pitcher receives a lip. When you're pouring it, you know the lip of the pitcher, right? It kind of resembles a lip. I mean, it's a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but that's the point, is that people are very imaginative, and you could give them as something, something as simple as a water pitcher, and they'll notice a lip on that pitcher, which says something much more about humans than it does about pitchers. 
and same with the bottle and the neck of the bottle. Maybe that one's a little less known to you, um, but people definitely call it the neck of the bottle. Think of a ketchup bottle. Um, here's where it gets a little deeper, though. Even what was cast beyond us, so something bigger than what you're finding in your room, something bigger than what you can even see with your own perspective. We also give metaphors to describe in some conceptual way. Uh, we gave the country a heart. So you can describe that as maybe the middle states is the heart of the country, or you could describe it as the values of the country. What you value is the heart of the beating heart of the country. Um, or if you've ever seen a hurricane from a bird's eye view from some camera, um, it has an eye, right? Or at least it looks like an eye because it's a little circle within a larger circle, uh, which is which we perceive as looking like an eye. Uh, and the mouth, a cave, right? So all of these things are bigger than us humans, but we still project, or maybe that's not the word you want to use, we see within that object ourself. We can't help but see ourselves in everything around us. And so that could show us that maybe we are deeply connected to this world that we live in, even if it's not just human beings, even if it's an everyday object. We make meaning from it by looking deeply into it and seeing how it looks like a human. There's a fun uh, thing you can search on Google called the places with or the faces in places and I think it's on Instagram too I found some pictures on Pinterest that I'll show up here you'll notice these are everyday objects but your eyes are going to start playing tricks on you because you will inevitably meaning you can't even help it but see faces in all of these everyday household objects this is a wheelbarrow but no it's a it's an astonished looking kind of dumbfounded face. Um, this is a pipe, but no, it's a man with a cigarette. This is a chair, <laughs> but it's a nervous looking kind of silly dinosaur like face. Uh, and this one's funny duck face, cannot unsee, right? Do you see the duck bill? It's everywhere. That's the point of this it's in fruit, it's in peppers, it's in planes. But regardless of what you're looking at, you're really seeing reflections of humanity and our own bodies, which is a deep mystery that Mueller is creating and, and showing you, revealing in a very poetic way, which is just awesome. Perhaps that answers your earlier questions of what the power and the purpose of poetry is, and that will lead you somewhere. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for tuning in for another day of language for your homework tonight. You will have to reflect on this Liesl Mueller poem. I'm going to ask you which stanza was particularly profound or um, impactful to you as you were listening to it and why you were drawn to that particular phrase or that, that stanza. Um, so this is what we're doing for a while. We're going to sit with the poetry. We're going to learn how to, how to study it. We're going to study meter. We're going to study metaphors, form, and content. Um, and we're going to have some fun. It's, it's almost the summer, and I think you guys needed something like this. All right. See you guys. So uh, we probably just have um, five minutes of 